Hi, I'm Leon. I'm one of the pastors here at HTBB, and it's a real joy to be able to spend the last day of 2023 with all of you. What has your year been like? If you're like me, I wonder if there are maybe some things you feel could have been a little better. Perhaps you didn't get the bonus that you were hoping for, or maybe the grades at school weren't exactly what you had been studying so hard for, or maybe you achieved everything you set out to achieve, but somehow you're still feeling a little unfulfilled or perhaps a little anxious thinking about the year that lies ahead. New year, new me. It seems to be the anthem of every new year where Christmas gift lists quickly become the proverbial New Year's resolution list. Say what you want about the New Year's resolution or the practice of New Year's resolutions, but I think it really highlights our innate desire for transformation. Maslow's hierarchy of needs places self-actualization at the top of the pyramid. In other words, to transform, to reach our full potential. That seems to be our deepest desire and the one that brings us the most fulfillment. It's why in the US alone, the self-help market reached a whopping $11.6 billion in 2021. But you see, this desire is not just a logical one. In fact, at its core, it's a theological desire because we are the very product of an act of transformation by a truly transformative God. We were designed with both the desire but also the capacity to transform. And I wonder if some of you here today might be feeling like you're perhaps beyond transformation. Well, God wants to assure you today that it's never too late to transform and that your transformation to the life that God has called you to can start right now. But just because we have the capacity to transform doesn't mean that it's easy. Strava, which is a fitness social platform I'm very fond of, uh, they produce a report every year where they collect all of the data from its users across the globe. And what they have found out is very interesting. According to the data, it shows that most people give up on their New Year's resolutions to exercise on exactly January the 12th. How very specific. In fact, quite coincidentally, the passage that we're going to look at today is Romans 12, which I feel gives us a really helpful guideline for what transformation can look like and how we can begin to outwork that in our daily lives as Christians. Shall we read together Romans 12? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many form one body and each member belongs to the others, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. 
In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12 is, it's quite a long text, but essentially it's a summary of all of the previous chapters of the Apostle Paul's writing. Someone who, by the way, uh, whose life was transformed from being one of the key persecutors of the Christians to becoming the most influential, one of the most influential people behind the spread of early Christianity. You see, in this text, he's essentially urging followers to transform their lives, to live counter-culturally, and to make an impact in society, empowered by the Holy Spirit and all done in the context of community. I like to think of this like the ChatGPT version or the SparksNote version of previous chapters, all the key takeaways nicely condensed and packaged here to help us move into action. What I found really interesting, however, is that the first thing that Paul tells us to do in verse 3 is to start with the renewing of your mind. And that takes us to our first point today, that transformation starts with the mind. It's an internal exercise first. You know, when we think of transformation, the natural tendency can be to default to the actions that we want to do, the things that we want to do more of. It's why most New Year's resolutions sound a little bit like exercise more, double the company's profits, ace my exams. But instead, the encouragement here is that transformation doesn't start with our doing, but in fact, from our being. Now, I don't consider myself a particularly smart person, but it turns out that my brain and yours are pretty amazing things. You know, we all have this impressive system in our brains with an equally impressive name, and it's called the reticular activating system. Now, this is basically a network of neurons in our brains with one core function, which is to filter out information. This filtering system is programmed essentially by our dominant thoughts. So it could be things that are either self-inflicted or perhaps from uh, events in the past. But what this means is essentially if you have a negative thought that maybe you're not good enough, not fit enough, not smart enough, very quickly your brain is able to filter out information that would make you believe that that is true. And that can have an effect on how you go on to live your life. That can have an effect on your actions. And that is where we get the phenomenon of the confirmation bias that some of you may have heard of before. Have you ever been in the market for a car or something that you've really wanted to buy? And maybe in that period, you've started to notice that there seems to be a lot more of that particular thing, that particular model on the road. Well, the truth is there aren't actually any more of that particular car or that particular model than usual. What's in fact happened is that our reticular activating system has been at work, doing its job to filter out every other car model and doubling down on the exact thing that you have set your eyes on, helping you to become more aware of that. The Greek word used for transform in verse 2 is metamorpho, which is the same word used to describe Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew 17, just before he ascended into heaven. If you're feeling like you're not good enough, or you know what, maybe there are some things that you could objectively do better in. The good news is that in Jesus, we have a new anchor to fix our minds on. You see, when Jesus left the throne of heaven to live on earth at Christmas, he started a journey to the cross, which would see him take on all of the sins of mankind for all generations and to die with them so that at his resurrection, we too can enjoy a life transformed and renewed to be able to share in his sonship. We are co-heirs to a throne of limitless power and one that lasts for all eternity. So if Jesus is our reference point for on which we anchor our being, we're essentially able to become more aware of opportunities to be more like him, to be able to hone in on the truths that he constantly speaks over us, truths that can conquer any lies that we may have been fed in the past, truths to overcome trauma, truths so life-changing that they will overflow into our every action and every interaction. In Jesus, we are not just called to positive thinking, but in fact, to infinite thinking. 
walking alongside a king who loves us infinitely more than we can ever imagine. But how do we do this? Maya Angelou said, words are things. You must be careful. They get on the walls, they get in your wallpaper, they get in the rugs, in your upholstery and in your clothes, and finally, in you. Words matter. And words have the power to both start and end wars. It's why we sing worship songs at church on a Sunday. It's not just Christian karaoke. In fact, it's a way that we allow biblical truths to literally reverberate in and through our very being as we engage in a very, very physical activity of singing out these words. So our input is important. But singing may not be the most accessible way to constantly feed ourselves with God's word. You know, ideally, we would want to be able to read or meditate on these truths at all times. And you know, I might not suggest that you suddenly burst into song at your next meeting. So one of the best ways that we can do that is to start to build a daily habit of getting some proper godly input into our day. And a great place to start is the Bible, which we've been talking about. Uh, this is a great way just to get a little bit of Bible reading into your day in a very guided, a very easy to follow manner. By spending time with God on a daily basis, even if it's just for a few minutes, we can begin to know Him better. And as that happens, we can have our eyes open to seeing ourselves the way He sees us. So I'd love to encourage you today, if you haven't already, to give this a go. Dan Melest, who was our associate vicar here before, uh, he gave me some really good advice, very practical advice uh, when it comes to reading the Bible. He said, if you miss a day, don't pressure yourself into trying to catch up on the previous day's readings. Just start from today's date. Now, this is really practical advice because if you miss a day, which I do a lot and still do, in fact, sometimes I miss multiple days, Basically, the bar to get back on track is set so low that you're less likely to feel a sense of dread about getting back on track, getting back to your reading, because all you need to do is just continue from where you left off. The next thing that can help us shift towards an infinite mindset is then by looking at our output. This is where prayer comes in. As we read truths in the Bible, praying to God allows us to then externalize those very words in prayer. Words received change us, but words we speak catalyze and accelerate change. It's why the Bible in one year ends each section of the Bible reading with a prayer. So pray to God and ask Him to give you eyes of faith, to see things as He sees them, and to direct your every thought and the actions that come out towards the life that He has called you to. So transformation begins with the renewing of our minds. The next thing about transformation is that it looks outwards. Jesus' own earthly life was one of service. So if being formed in Christ is to be like Him, that means that the outworkings of our transformation should always be to serve others, pointing to the one who gave His very life in the ultimate act of service to all mankind. But where do we start? In verses 5 to 8, Paul says, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. He then goes on to say, uh, or then he then goes on to give examples of what this can look like, which I find very helpful. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. I love me a good list. And what a comprehensive one this is. And best of all, notice how none of those uh, roles are tied to a particular vocation or position. You don't need to change your job or circumstance in order to make an impact to those around you. And you definitely don't need to try to be somebody else. You were designed in a particular way to serve a very particular purpose in the wider body unified by Christ. Even if you feel like maybe you're a little rough around the edges, or maybe you feel a little ill-equipped, God can use you today. I'm part Kalabit uh, from one of the smallest tribes in Borneo. And in fact, fun fact, my uh, ancestors were headhunters. And by that, I don't mean that we were corporate recruiters. I mean, we would quite literally 
people that we didn't get along with. Uh, but don't worry, I'm, I, I don't bite. I'm good. But you see, on a less morbid note, some of you may have heard of the Barrio Revival that happened in 1973. Uh, you can read up a bit more about it in your own time. There are some really good books out there, one of which uh, is a book called Rushing Wind, which is a reissue, um, getting some first-hand accounts um, from people who were a part of the revival. And it has a little bit at the end uh, where it actually has uh, excerpts from people from my generation, second generation, uh, and onwards giving their reflections as well. So that's a great read that you can read up on um, if you like. But in short, this was when a remote village in Barrio saw a unique overflowing of the Holy Spirit that started with a bunch of school kids and then went on to touch the school teachers and eventually the neighboring villages too, as people convicted by the Holy Spirit went from village to village preaching and healing the sick. Now, my dad was one of those kids uh, in the kampung. And, you know, as the story goes, what had happened is that him and his best friend, um, Osat, um, they were studying for their exams. And every night they would get underneath the longhouse. And before they began their studies, they would pray together. But one night, something unusual happened. As they were going through their routine prayer, they started to pray in tongues. And it was very strange because this had never happened to them. And in fact, they didn't even know that there was such a thing as praying in tongues. So what had happened is they had thought that they had been possessed. <laughs> and so at the end of that, they were, they were shocked. And they told each other, well, I don't know what has happened, but let's, let's agree to not tell anybody about this strange experience. And so they left it at that. The next morning when they turned up for uh, their school assembly, uh, it turns out that suddenly one kid got up and started to share of his experience from the night before, which was exactly what the two of them had experienced as well. And what was amazing is that as this happened, suddenly more and more children started to stand up saying, we had the same experience too. And then that led to teachers and eventually the principal of the school as well, breaking, out, breaking down um, in tears confessing his sins and saying, we too had the same experience. All of this would later culminate into what we know today as the Barrio Revival. Fast forward to today, and that revival cohort has gone on to be highly influential in both ministry, but also in the marketplace. My dad likes to say it was a moment where they had become aware of what it meant to be loved and called by God. Revival here started at the level of the individual, with different groups of students experiencing God's presence in a very unique and special way, but then culminated into something that would go on to serve the community in not just a spectacular way, but also a very practical way. And while the tendency can be sometimes to just be wowed and focus on all of the supernatural and the spectacle of it all for both the revivals in Barrio as well as Bakalalan, what I have found a lot more interesting and what I've perhaps been more drawn to has always been the fruit that has come out of it. You know, as a church, we've been thinking a lot about how to engage and empower the emerging generations in our congregation. And a big part of my job uh, on staff here at HDBB is to look after our online content. And so naturally, I spend a lot of time trawling through social media to gather insights on what Gen Zs interact with, what they say, and, and how they think. And now on one of my digital quests, shall we say, I chanced upon this post uh, by a Christian Gen Z advocate. And I thought the post was really interesting. It was a carousel post and the title was, here's how Gen Zs see revival. And it goes on to describe that to the Gen Zs, revival is not a five hour long service. Revival is serving the poor, needy and broken. Revival is being the hands and feet of Jesus. Revival is the gospel applied. Revival is the truth revealed. Revival is tangible freedom, not just a fuzzy feeling. Revival is the gospel lived out beyond a great worship moment. Revival is high character in tough moments. I love the fact that for Gen Zs, the fruit of revival is more important than the mechanics than how it looks. By this token, revival is simply the inner transformation of the individual formed in Christ, which then spurs us into action that would then point others back to him. Revival is for everyone. 
You see, just as God was able to use a bunch of school children to heal the sick and preach the gospel in just that number of weeks, He is able to use us wherever we are, no matter how ill-equipped we might feel to make a difference. Where might God be wanting you to work out your inner transformation today? So transformation starts with the mind. Transformation then works outwardly. But lastly, transformation scales at the rate of love. The big enabler outlined in Romans 12 is to live counterculturally in a way that demonstrates God's love in action. Earlier in the passage, we saw Paul emphasizing the importance of diversity in serving the wider body of the church. And now he drives home this point even further by outlining how we are to do everything out of love for one another. But why was Paul so focused on unity? You see, at the time that Paul was writing to the early Christian church, he was speaking to a very diverse community made up of both Jewish and Gentile believers. You see, the Jewish Christians were steeped in Old Testament teachings and traditions, while the Gentile Christians came from a predominantly pagan background. And these polarities created a very unique set of challenges in terms of theology, cultural practices, as well as social interactions. And so it is in this setting that Paul instructs the early church to be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Unity is so important if we want to effect any large-scale change. It's why you'll often notice that in the advent of a big change, maybe just before a really big or maybe even during a really massive project at work, or perhaps a big change in your household or in your season, the first thing that usually seems to be most at risk of breaking down is the unity with those around you. It's why Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 15, that every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Are you going through a season of disunity, either at home or at work? If you are, the encouragement is that while God does not cause these things to happen, He can certainly turn what was meant for evil for good. In Jesus, we can know that transformation lies on the other side of resistance. And if you've got people around you who are maybe a little tricky to love, we can ask for God's supernatural love. The same love that allowed Him to pray for those who crucified Him. The same love that allowed Him to persevere through excruciating pain so that we might enjoy a direct relationship with God and eternal life as co-heirs to the kingdom of heaven. We can love because He first loved us. And it's precisely this countercultural love of feeding our enemies and overcoming evil with good that sets us apart in order that we might point people to the very source of that difference, Jesus Christ Himself. A few months ago, Dan Blythe who is the global uh, director of Alpha for Youth. He spoke at our service here at HTBB and he spoke about Gen Zs and he said this thing that really struck out to me. He said that they might be called the snowflake generation, but snowflakes can mobilize to become snowballs and snowballs into avalanches. What a powerful image for all of us. And I believe that this is indeed, while he was talking for, about Gen Zs, I do believe this is for all of us to take home. You know, the more counterculturally we live, the more curious people start to become about what makes us different as Christians. At HTBB, we run Alpha three times a year. And the real magic of Alpha to me is the fact that people can come and ask questions, any and all questions about life and faith without judgment, and just to feel loved and accepted. Many of our core leaders here at HTBB today on both our staff team as well as our volunteer teams have come out of being able to ask these questions and just from a sheer sense of feeling loved by their community through Alpha or even Connect groups. And the amazing thing is that this cycle continues. And it's exactly what happens in the early church. You know, from growing from a, a very scattered population of tens of thousands at the time when Paul was probably writing this, to being the world's largest religion today. The snowflakes turned into snowballs, which became an avalanche. 
And the story continues. And best yet, we can continue to play our part in a global story of transformation, driven by the love of Christ. Transformation starts with the mind, where we take stock of what isn't helpful in our way of thinking, and as we draw near to God, asking Him to form us to be more like Him. It then looks outwards in service, with all of us asking how can we outwork our transformation in our current fields of influence. And finally, transformation is to be scaled and multiplied at the rate at which we love those around us. You see, when we are filled by the love of an almighty King, to then love those around us and to spur them on to do the same for others, that is what true transformation looks like in God's kingdom. And what a joy that we can all play our part right here, right now. Shall we pray? Come Holy Spirit, Lord, I thank you that you have called us all to play a part in your global story of transformation. I thank you that none of us are beyond transformation, that it is in fact in our very design to be able to be transformed in order to transform our surroundings. Lord, would you come and fill us right now would you bring to mind any areas that may be hindering us from living the life that you have called us to, Lord? And as we give those things to you, Lord, would you help us to have eyes of faith? Would you undo any lies in the past that have been fed to us? Would you help us to see ourselves just as you see us, Lord? And Lord, out of that overflow, would our actions be so in line with your person, with who you are, Jesus? And that just as you came onto earth to serve us, even to the point of dying on a cross, Lord, would you give us that same sacrificial heart for our communities, for our workplaces, for our homes? Help us, Lord, to be servant leaders, to bring practical transformation, practical help playing our part, Lord, and Lord, most importantly, would you, fill us, would you fill us with love? Help us to know how much you love us, Lord, to then be able to love those around us, even those who are tricky. Come, Holy Spirit, we commit our lives, we commit this new year that we approach into your hands. Come and fill us and be with us as we step into this new season of transformation. Thank you, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we take a moment to worship now? 